On the other hand, we were also forewarned by a Russian not to continue on one particular highway because it went past the distillery where many of his comrades had gathered for free drinks of rye and where rape was the norm. Needless to say, we took a large detour on a sun sandy country road to avoid the guests of the distillery. The moral of the story is there are two types of people everywhere. Those who are decent and care and those who don't. As a result of the war and rape, to some of my surviving cousins, one half or part Russian children were born. So I do not want to paint too bleak a picture for their sakes. In some total, we returned home by walking back to the same devastated two and a half provinces. We were looking forward to sleeping in our own beds after such a long and arduous journey only to find our home destroyed by artillery fire. The city had changed hands seven times. The French foreign legionnaires from the Waffen-SS garrison ran out of ammunition and fuel several times, but after being resupplied would retake the city each time. Needless to say, there was much devastation in some areas of the city and the bridge across the Rieger River was blown up. Our former neighbors, was a pretty young woman who lived in her upstairs apartment. Her husband had not yet returned from the Eastern Front and she had just given birth to her first baby on the same day the Russians showed up. She was also mass raped by these uncultivated beings who wore Russian uniforms that very day. Our neighbor from across the road named Billy Girls had a good business manufacturing, inscribing and polishing gravestones with the free help of French POWs. He was a real Nazi and drove a DKW sports car during the war. He had even gas to spare. This fellow was a shrewd opportunist and he was known as the Judas Iscariot of our hometown. He was a chameleon, an instant communist and stood at the walled city gate and pointed out all his former friends and associates to the Russians and to the Polish police or milites. That may sound fine, but you see, on the German existing laws of the Third Reich, if you had a job as a civil servant, letter carrier, teacher, railroad station master, or in, in any other public service as a clerk, you had to be in the party, if you liked it or not. Can you imagine how many families, mainly women and children, with their breadwinners still missing on the Eastern Front, got carted to jail, to jail and shot because of this fellow. And the jobs these husbands once held were not even party related. He just had earned a living as civil servants. It was said uh, that this fellow would sell his own grandmother for a mere sandwich. Crises of this magnitude really bring out the character of mankind or the lack thereof. Our daily working routine of forced labor included unloading potatoes in the field from horse-drawn wagons. They were large potato bags weighing approximately 80 to 100 pounds each, which was more than we ourselves weighed, and then we planted the potatoes on bended back. It was a struggle and later on we picked up and carted bricks from the ruins. Our reward was some very watered down kapusta soup, meaning cabbage soup, with very few potatoes in it and no meat, just a bit of salt, plus one little piece of dry bread once a day. We experienced forced labor besides starvation. Six weeks later, we were escorted on the so-called Polish armed protection, or rather rape and plunder, away from our homeland. This was our third handcart trek, but with fewer belongings. You know, these things are really very difficult to write about because of intermarriage within our own larger family, which include very good souls from Eastern Europe. Nevertheless, here are some excerpts of our pilgrimage. My 72-year-old Uncle Julius Dopperfool was beaten to death with a rifle butt by two of our young fanatical conquerors, 
because he could not climb the ladder fast enough into the hayloft in order to throw down some hay to feed the livestock. To put the following into perspective, I want you to understand that it is always a few mean fanatics who make the rest of the people of different nationalities look bad. In reality, there are also many other good-hearted people among each nation. I just happened to witness firsthand some of the worst of the lot. The new owners of the land compelled us to walk to the Russian occupied zone, like a herd of helpless sheep. This was our third long distance forced march through the same foodless two and a half provinces where people were starving and decomposing bodies of both humans and animals were laying on the road. Just imagine the stench. An altogether bleak picture for us civilians. Our so-called armed protective Polish escorts plundered a poor refugee column of its last belongings. Our next door neighbor's 17-year-old daughter was foolish enough to wear her new tall red leather boots for this journey. She was a college student. The escorts grabbed her and pulled off her boots. She had to wrap rags around her feet for the rest of the journey. These fellows took everything of ours, such as food, jewelry, and so forth. During the hassle over some fancy wedding and engagement rings, an old woman was pulled into the ditch. She had arthritic finger knuckles and our conquerors could not pull off her rings. These crafty fellows just cut off her finger when they could not get the rings off otherwise. I had hidden my mother's plain wedding ring and our birth documents and other valuables by sewing them into the lining of my old dilapidated dirty head. So they were safe, but we lost our last bit of food to them. We had previously scavenged a bombed out ammunition train which was had also a boxcar attached to it which contained bags of brown sugar. People were like ants all over the boxcar. We had managed to get 25 pounds of this precious commodity for ourselves. This was the only food we had and we rationed it by eating only one half a cup of a family member per day. Well, the armed poles took our sugar under the pretext of searching for weapons, which we would hardly harbor under such conditions. It was summer by now, and we su survived on wild berries and on one-year-old potatoes that were left in earth mounds. The latter were soft like rubber. There was no food at all in the stores. Many of them were burned to the ground. So we did not have to dread going shopping in a crowded superstore like some of us do today. There was not even one morsel to be found. We just scavenged the ruins for last year's leftovers. We walked during four journeys on foot, a total distance almost equal in mileage from Ottawa, Ontario to Manitoba, which our first pilgrimage beginning in midwinter. We met also many good-hearted people from other nations on a hard car trek. Some of them were very helpful and real good Christians, whereas others were the opposite and very hostile. While on our hand car trek, we met two Russian soldiers who stopped their truck and motioned us to come over to them. Being wary of previous ill treatments, we did not dare go near them for our mother's and ten-year-old sister's sake. These two Russian soldiers looked like World War II veterans who had seen a lot. They lowered the rear truck gate, put something on the pavement and drove off with their arms waving at us. When we finally got near the spot, we discovered to our surprise that it was a big chunk of raw beef wrapped in paper. A guardian angel must have sent them because we were totally exhausted and starving. This was the only meat we had for the last six months. We went quickly off a side road back into the woods and my mother cooked the beef and we ate all of it quickly for fear that someone would come along and take it away from us. 